nothing here but misery. This game's not worth 60. Nice is 7.99. So switch version is broken. This game gave people seizures. I wasted my time with this game. So you should not do the same. Seriously, what was you did not go? When Bow and Wonderworld was initially revealed to the world in July of 2020, I was ecstatic to see what this amazing world had in store for us. And then to have former head of Sonic Team Yuji Naka at the helm, with the original character designer of Sonic the Hedgehog, Noto Oshima, at the character designer and co-creator of this game, there was no reason for me not to be excited. Then the demo came out and all that excitement turned into severe chronic pain. If you guys seen my video called Please Delay Bow and Wonderworld, which spoiler alert, they didn't. But if you guys seen that video, you would know what my problems are with the demo. In short, the player speed was horrendous, the animations looked stiff and lifeless across all the upgrades, the switch port looked absolutely disgusting, everything being mapped to one button seemed like an unnecessary and idiotic decision, and the entire game was boring. But that was just the demo. So, what are my thoughts on the final game? To the surprise of absolutely no one, most of the problems that people had with Battle Motor World's demo are still present in the full game. Now, that's not to say that no changes were made, they did have a day one patch that increased the player speed very slightly since that seemed to be the main complaint most people had from the demo, including yours truly. In fact, here's a little comparison I made showing the difference in player speed between the demo and the full game. And as you could see, it really isn't that much of a change, but I think it's still better than nothing. In fact, during the demo, I mentioned that your player moved so slow that no matter how long you've played the game, you will constantly be reminded of just how slow you're going. Well, I'm happy to say that I didn't quite feel that anymore in the full game. Don't get me wrong, I still think the movement speed is still pretty damn slow compared to other 3D platformers, but at least I was able to get used to it this time. Again, not that much of a change, but a slight improvement overall. But improvement or not, I would be lying if I didn't tell you that this game was an absolute chore to finish for this review. In fact, the only reason I finished this game is specifically because I'm reviewing it. There was not the slightest bit of me that wanted to beat it out of curiosity, investment, or just to have a relaxing time. I be all 10 plus hours of this game purely out of obligation, nothing more. I worked this hard to get to this point for this review, so let's start with the plot. You play as one of two children. They become sad for one reason or another. They get kidnapped by Balan and thrown into this random world with Furbies. They go through 12 worlds that each have a random character dealing with some sort of sadness. These random characters become an evil boss. You defeat the evil boss at the end of each world. The person becomes good again. You dance. You do this 12 times, and then you go home. Oh, I'm sorry, you think I'm joking? No. For anyone who is only playing the game, that's pretty much all the plot you're going to get. You want to know the actual story? Well, you're going to need to buy the separate Battle and Wonderworld book to really know what's going on here. For like the one person who cares this much to know, the story takes place in the magical Balan Theater being run by Balan himself. The Balan Theater appears when someone's heart loses its balance. In the story, he plays Emma Cole or Leo Craig. Yes, that is their real names. No, this is not auto-generated as far as that is to believe. Leo's story centers around him socially isolating himself as a result of an argument he had with a friend a few years ago. And Emma's story is about anxiety and worrying about what other people are saying behind her back. They are both brought to the Balan Theater where they go through 12 worlds that were created from the hearts of troubled people. Along the way, you have to deal with Lance, essentially Balan's complete opposite who has control of these dark monsters called Nagati. Leo and Emma go through 12 worlds freeing people who are dealing with their troubles. You fight Lance, and then everyone is taken back to their worlds. Before Leo and Emma leave, they hug Balan because I guess they somehow grew a connection for him, which makes Balan shed a tear. Balan decides to show them his true fo- OH MY GOD WHAT IS THAT?! THAT'S TERRIFYING! PUT THE HAT BACK ON! JESUS CHRIST! Balan sends them back to their world where the characters are now more confident and mentally stronger. 
Leo's over his social isolation, while Emma learns that the secret people were hiding was for a birthday party thrown for her that her servants were keeping secret. Did... did she not know it was her birthday? Anyways, that's essentially the story of Bound Wonderworld, and I'm left wondering why the hell they couldn't just make the story any clearer in the game itself. It's not even that complex, and that's not to say that the story is bad. It's harmless for the most part. The problem is it's not in the game itself. Though I have heard the way they tell the story in the book isn't so great either. It sounds like it's so convoluted and probably like 99.9% .9 hot air. That really sucks to see because I think the idea of a game tackling character sadness and depression is something you don't see done a whole lot. In fact, I think a lot of kids would benefit from a story centering about getting better mentally. It's just too bad this game didn't want to tell the story that was already there because I think the basis surrounding it is heartwarming. Anyways, let's not focus anymore on the story since the developers didn't seem to care that much either. So, how is the gameplay? Bound Wonderworld's gameplay may look like it's as vast as an ocean, but that ocean is the depth of a puddle. This game has some of the most brain-dead level design I've ever seen for a platformer. Jump here, move block here, tap button here, and you're finally done. This game is the definition of A plus B equals C when it comes to gameplay. For example, to collect a power-up, you first need to collect a key. Sounds like you're going to be doing a good amount of exploration, right? Well, wrong. Almost any time there is a costume power-up capsule, there is usually a key sitting right next to it. In fact, it happens so often, I'm left wondering what the point of the key system even was. Again, it's brain dead. Actually, let's talk about the costume power-up since that seems to be their main selling point for this game. In almost every advertisement for Battle and Wonderworld, they would mention that there's 80 plus unique power-ups to collect. That's right, 80 unique power-ups. You have to think to yourself, how could the developers manage such a large task without creating power-ups that are either duplicates and making fleshed out level design to accommodate all power-ups in the game that is fun? The answer is, they can't, and didn't. I specifically mentioned in my Delay Battle in Wonder World video that there was no way the developers were going to be able to put 80 plus unique power-ups in the game without there being overlap or without some sort of power-up completely nullifying others. What is that? Maybe it's just too casual. Hmm. Maybe it's just too casual for like a lot of people. You hold while floating. This is the same as the freaking sheep that I just replaced. What's the difference? And I could spam it probably. What's the difference? It's the same thing. You're like I, I said it. They're gonna have overlap. Yeah, that's why. That's why I said this game. This game would probably do a lot better if it was like an iPad game. So, <laughs> tell me why. Yeah. All right. Where's the difference? What's the difference, Chad? I mean, we what already, was the difference? We already saw that coming with with the cat with the cat costume. What's the difference? The other one was just slightly faster. To see, said Balin with a snort. This place is a maze. Not everything you see should be believe. Uh, should believe. Sorry. Uh, I'm not stupid. Snapped Leo peevishly because he's an asshole to Balin. This is just pounding uh, pig. Remember that pig suit that also floats and stomps? It's the same thing! The families and couples he had seen oh strolling around. Honestly, to me, it feels like the concept of pushing 80 plus costumes in this game was made before development even started. I mean, why else do they say this in every advertisement of the game? My only assumption is that in their eyes, they think that the more power-ups the game has, the more appealing it will be to children. And honestly, I don't think that is something kids even care about. And speaking of children, was this game made for three-year-olds? Because like I mentioned, when the demo came out, every single button on your controller does the same thing. And the resilience by the developers to keep it that way is astonishing. There is literally power-ups in the game that feel like they require two buttons, but since the developers can never let that be a reality, they have some of the power-ups do their secondary move automatically. No joke. For example, the chest power-up called the Quad Cannon, it shoots automatically in all directions so the player can still have the ability to jump. Oh yes. no, is this is this it? Wait, Hold what? On. Oh my god, it shoots by itself. No, 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 even better. It only shoots when you're standing still. And it shoots in different directions because you can't aim by yourself either. 
Oh my god. They really oh. wanted to keep the one button thing, so. Cool game. There are many examples of the game doing things automatically for you purely to keep the one button gameplay. Yuji Naka, Square Enix, literally anyone on the development team. Why do this to yourself? Why limit yourself so much like this? Was it that hard to allow players to have the ability to have at least two buttons? It's like they are afraid to do that in fear that it would make it too hard for kids, which is literally not true. Look at what kids are playing now. They're literally playing games like Fortnite, which is a battle royale with so many mechanics to the games. Kids aren't stupid, especially for as something as simple as a platform game. You know it's sad when I could beat your entire 3D platform game with just a joystick and one button. All you guys accomplished by making your game incredibly simplistic was alienating anyone who has ever played any video game ever. Congrats guys, it must have been really hard for you to accomplish that one. And you want to know the most frustrating part about this game? The game is called Balan Wonderworld. But you don't even get to play as Balan. Yeah, you know, the one character we've seen in all the trailers that essentially drawn us to this game. You don't get to play as him. You only get these boring QTE sections with him. But are you kidding me? Look at what Balan can do. I want to be in full control of that. Naka knows better than anyone that we want another game like Knights. This would be the perfect opportunity to do that, but decided to waste it on a boring QTE section. Which speaking of, is repeated over and over and over and over and over and over and over again with the same animations! There are like three or four different variations of these QTE sections in your entire game, and some levels have about three or four of these sections in each world. Are you kidding me? I don't want to play this. It's boring, brainless, and a complete pace breaker from the rest of the game. And that's saying a hell of a lot when the rest of the game was already a drag to play. And don't even get me started with the trophies you collect while playing these QTE sections. And these random out of place mini games that have no correlation to the level whatsoever. To get the trophies in these sections, you need to get a perfect. That's right, not a single mistake. If you do make a mistake, you need to wait till the QTE is over, exit the level, re-enter the level from the hub world, and replay everything just to get to this point in the level, just to get another chance at this section. That is bullshit. Right, I guess now would be a good time to bring up these trophies. Yes, Balan Wonderworld has collectibles that are essentially the power stars of the game. Each level has a good amount you can collect, you collect past a certain threshold, and then you can unlock the next area. And while it wasn't too hard to find these trophies, there were moments where I didn't have enough to advance and it required me to go back to previous levels to find trophies that I may have missed the first time. And honestly, on paper, it doesn't sound that bad, but any reason to play this game any more than I needed to hurts my soul. That's why when I finally beat the game and I unlocked the secret third acts of each world, I wasn't particularly excited at the idea of having to play this game even more. One of the bugs. <gasps> and then they that? waited. All... This was the greatest story ever told. In Balan Wonderworld. Hey, Sam. Shut up. Hold on. <laughs> Believe it or not, though, I think some of the best levels in this game are in the third act. That's not to say all of them are good. Hell no. I'm looking at you, Chapter 9, Act 3. But a good amount of them do give the player a good bit of challenge on finding these trophies and requires the player to think a little bit outside of the box. It's just a shame it took 10 plus hours of brain dead gameplay to get to this moment. And that is assuming you don't already have a costume that completely breaks the game. In fact, during my playthrough, I used the Frost Fairy for almost all of the trophies. Why would I go out of my way to use other costumes that make the experience more mundane when I could use this one that pretty much does all I need it to? It clears a bunch of gaps that the game throws at you and it moves upwards, which allows you to reach places that other costumes can't even reach. And it's not like you get this costume at the very end of the game. No, you get this in the first act of the eighth world, making the last four worlds and the third acts you unlock afterwards a complete cakewalk. And on the topic of the costumes, 
you can tell they were struggling to hit that 80 costumes number that were in the advertisements because some of these costumes are either incredibly situational or flat out laughable. For example, the Box Fox, a costume that I quote from the game, allows the wearer to transform into an invincible box. The costume transforms between Fox and Box when it feels like it. Wow, what an amazing description. And you know what? I'm not even going to hate on it that much, because this was the first costume in my arsenal to actually get a first hit on the final boss. Oh, dude, we got to do Fox Box, guys. <laughs> Come on, guys. Why wouldn't we choose the Fox Box? Oh, my God. Wait, Ooh. no. <laughs> and you want to know something that is seriously frustrating regarding the gameplay of the costumes? Just how long it takes to switch between them. The entire point of the game is to grab costumes, switch between them and use them to your advantage. So then why the hell have a switching animation that completely breaks the pace of the game every time you use it? And on the topic of that, why in co-op does the second player not have the ability to hold on to costumes and collect them in stages? Yeah, you know, the entire point of the game, the second player can't even play it as it was intended. Every time you go into a new world, the second player will start with nothing. Every. Single. Time. So instead of making a co-op a fun and collaborative mode, you made it a handicap. Because now, the first player is essentially carrying dead weight. The presentation of the game isn't even anything that great. The graphics of the game itself really isn't anything too special. It's not the worst, I'll be honest. But the game itself isn't something to write home about. It looks like it's something that would be available on the Xbox 360 or the PS3. And that's not even counting the Switch version. The Switch version is absolutely disgusting. What the hell are these textures? Everything on the Switch version looks so muddy. The frame rate absolutely tanks when literally anything in the game happens like enemies appearing and the colors for some reason look so much darker. There is honestly zero excuse for the game to look this bad on the Switch. There are games on the Switch right now that look 10 times better than this game does. I'm left to believe it was just a super quick and lazy porting job regarding the Switch. There are also a good amount of technical issues that this game has that's not just on the Switch version. There were times where my camera would get stuck, where my player would get stuck, unresponsive or super delayed jumps, or as I mentioned earlier, random screen flashes that can cause epileptic seizures. And on the topic of the game's presentation, the animations are laughable. Seriously, it looks like something you would see on Dreams or a fan-made game. I've questioned ever since the demo why the animations look this awkward, and I'm left to assume that they just wanted an animation that could work for the majority of the costumes in the game, so that way they don't need to make 80 different running animations. And I think I'm correct on that assumption, because the majority of them look like they use the same animation. And it's not just the running animation that looks awkward as hell, but pretty much every animation that isn't the CGI animation looks mo-crapped. And don't even get me started on the dance numbers. Dear God, don't get me started on the dance numbers. What the f is this shit? Am I seriously supposed to feel some sort of emotion watching these? Because all you're going to get out of me is laughter. And especially when you start reusing animations for the dance numbers as well. Come on, guys. And then we have the Isle of Tims. Hey, guys, you guys remember the Chow Garden from Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2? Good, because these are nothing like that. The Isle of Tims is a central hub that gives you access to all the different worlds in the game. But you are free to roam this area and take care of your Tims, these little Furby-like creatures that eat drops that you collect from the levels. And that's literally it. You feed them, they grow, you breed them, that's it. Over time, the more Tims you get, the more you unlock in the world. Like these trampoline things, or this thing called the Tower of Tims, which doesn't do anything. But it looks cool, I guess. The Tims can appear in levels and they do help you out by giving you items like keys or drops, which is nice, but I really don't think they do anything significant. I'm left wondering what the point of this place even is. It's like Yuji Naka knows that people wanted something similar to the Chow Garden to come back, but doesn't understand what made them so special in the first place. From my understanding though, once you collect enough rainbow drops and drop them at this statue here in the world, you could unlock the ultimate costume which is not Balan himself, but a costume of Balan that completely breaks the game in half. 
Seriously, what is the point of this costume? You might as well snap your disc in half at this moment because the game is non-existent. Look, I know the majority of this review has been quite negative, but my experience with this title was just that painful. And it truly hurts because the trailers for this game really had me excited to see what Naka has up his sleeve. If there are a few positives I could give this game, it's the music. Seriously, this stuff is amazing, and you could tell a lot of work and love was put into it. It's just a shame that the game also suffers from the Sonic Unleashed Werehog Syndrome, where anytime there's a single enemy on the screen, it stops playing the amazing stage music and goes back to playing the same old bagpipes, like for God's sake, play something else! Another positive I could give the game is the amazing CGI cutscenes. Seriously, this stuff looks phenomenal, and it really shows off Notoshima's amazing character designs. And that's another thing, I think the character designs of this game are great. It screams early 2000s and late 90s Sega, and I adore it. But at the end of the day, Battle Wonder World is a game I don't think anyone should be itching to play anytime soon, or ever for that matter. Even for anyone who has kids, don't get them this game. There are so many better platformers out there with way more polish and can leave a way more memorable experience than this game. Not to mention this game is retailing for $60! Do you know how many amazing games you could get right now for $60? This game's not even worth $10, and that is not even an exaggeration. You have to have some serious ball Square Enix to ask for the same amount as a full price AAA game for Balan freaking Wonder World. With that said, what does the future hold for Yuji Naka or the Balan company as a whole? Well, only time will tell, but it does look quite bleak right now. And considering this was apparently Naka's one chance to make a platform game for Square Enix, I'm sad to see this one flop as hard as it is. Naka, I love you man, but this game just wasn't it. Thank you all for watching this video. Please share and like if you enjoyed. Let me know in the comments what you guys think about Bound Wonder World, and please subscribe for more videos coming soon. This is Sam, signing out. See you later, procrastinators.